National Quilting Day is Saturday. Everybody at the church is welcome to come out to that. Um, you can learn what the uh, ladies, the quilting ladies do. That's from um, 10 to 2. I'm sorry, 10 to noon. So any children that want to, that want to come out, they'll have something for y'all to do. Or if you just want to come out and look to see what they do, they'll be out um, Saturday. And um, from 10 a.m. to lunchtime, and, and you can get involved and uh, learn what, what they do. Uh, daylight savings time is Saturday night. Uh, I believe we're still collecting candy for the Easter egg hunt. The Easter egg hunt is going to be March 24th here at the church. So put that on your calendar. Uh, is there any other announcements? Anything, any clarifications? Let us uh, prepare our hearts and minds for worship. morning. I would just like to um, say first of all hello to Dee and Michaela and Potter 
Hi, Arl is Joe, and hi, Mom and Dad. Um, Mom, this is one of those days when the haircut that you commented on last time I was home about being cut curly, yeah, it's curly today, thanks to the humidity. I know that uh, we have someone who would like to share a thank you. Yes, lines. Um, I'm having uh, cataract surgery this week, Tuesday on the left eye, Wednesday on the right eye, and um, they tell me that for at least a few days, maybe a couple of weeks, it's going to be a challenge, if even possible, to see anything up close. So next Sunday might be a little bit of a comedy as I try and figure out what I can see and can't see and where that needs to be. My wife has sent me a whole box of different kinds of readers and we're hoping that one of those will work. But at this point, I don't know what to expect next Sunday. So it'll be, it'll be fun. Uh, we, we begin with our greeting. Let's stand. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us share the peace of Christ with each other. God's peace. seated. We hear from the Word. The first reading is from the book of Exodus 20 verses 1 through 7 and it's on page 72 in your pew Bible. Okay. 
Okay. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. <clears throat> the second reading is from 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 31, page 1131 in your pew Bible. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Here ends the reading.
St. John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. 
in the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what signs do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, you may be seated. I wonder if you've heard or said this. If only we could put the Ten Commandments back up on the walls of the courtrooms or the schools or maybe, maybe even, even the churches. churches. Anybody heard that? Yeah. yeah. My, My question, question is why? Do the Ten Commandments have some kind of magical quality? That would mysteriously set everything right? Will, will such a display get people to start doing the right things? Or maybe that putting these up on the wall will somehow make God happy because we're displaying his word? Let's, let's be real here. Our culture has pretty much decided that the first table law, what we heard read, the table that talks about our relationship with God is really no longer valid. We have all kinds of things that we can worship as God, a lot of them things that we make up on our own. So we'd have to leave those commandments off. And then we... Well, we pretty much decided to, as a culture, that we're going to ignore the second table of the law, which has to do with how we treat each other. So we have to leave those off as well. And well, that leaves us with nothing. Well, the argument goes, these 10 words, that's what it's called in the scripture, would serve as the foundation of the Judeo-Christian law. Mm. No, not really. You see, we've moved away from any belief of an objective standard, and, and now law is about clever interpretation of the law, not about what's really there. Well, some have said to me, maybe we can learn about the ethics expressed in the Bible without all that faith stuff. Yeah, well, that doesn't work either. Because the worship of Yahweh and the following of the code expressed in the Ten Commandments kind of go hand in hand. And really, if you don't have one, it's not long before you don't have the other. If you go back and actually read the story as it's told, first in the book of Exodus and then the book of Deuteronomy, you'll see that what's going on here is that God has already rescued, he's already saved the Hebrew people. That is, he's already in a relationship with them. 
So the Ten Commandments are not about creating a relationship with God. They're about how that relationship is expressed. And only when he's in relationship with the people does he speak these words. Did you, did you hear that in the lesson? We think of them as always being written down on stone. That didn't happen until later. First, he speaks these words to the group of people gathered at Mount Sinai. Later, they get inscribed in stone. And these ten words, the, the word that is used in Greek is dekalog, deka meaning ten, log, logos meaning words, ten words are part of a much larger covenant ceremony. And the final result of that covenant ceremony is nothing less than the salvation of the world. So there's a lot more going on here in this whole story of the com Ten Commandments than, as a song from my youth expressed it, do this, don't do that, can't you read the sign? It's a whole lot more. This is my copy of the Constitution of the United States. I pull it out about once a year and I read it to remind myself, what does it mean to be an American? Sadly, I'm not sure we're paying much attention to this anymore, so maybe it doesn't mean as much as I thought. But the larger covenant that the Ten Commandments is a part of served very much like the Constitution does for us. It served as Israel's Constitution. Here God shapes a bunch of homeless vagabonds into a nation while also sculpting an entire culture, politically, socially, and spiritually. Knowing who their God was, how their God acted, excuse me, mm, and what their God expected of them created an amazingly secure foundation for the people known as Israel. A second document from our world helps us grasp the significance of the covenant. It's a birth certificate. Now, I'd show you mine but it's so old it's starting to turn to dust. So what I could show you though is a picture that I took of something that hangs on the wall in one of the rooms in our house back in Kansas. It's a picture of the Storkram that my father sent to his brother on the day that I was born. It's kind of a neat thing. If you want to see it, I'll show it to you. I don't even know if they do anything like that anymore. But this document was an agreement between God and his people. And in this agreement, as they accepted it, a new nation comes into being. God says to them, I brought you out of the house of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I've made you. I've set you free. And thus, they were born. So the nation was to be centered around their relationship with God, the God who had rescued them. And they're to live together as children of this God, reflecting in their relationship with each other and with others the relationship that God has with them. And God gives them many incentives to follow. He tells them that obedience means a long, healthy life, bountiful crops, many children, and victorious armies. Of course, he also tells them what's going to happen if they don't obey, and it's the reverse of all those good things. So the Ten Commandments, that section of the covenant, was meant to preserve and protect this new society, allowing it to thrive in what was a very and extremely hostile environment. A third modern document helps us to grasp the emotional connection, and that is the marriage license. Now, the, the singer that I, that I first came to admire and become a fan of when I was a kid was Glenn Campbell. And in one of his more popular songs, he refers to the marriage license as ink stains that are dried upon some line. Not, not exactly a very nice view of it. But marriage is entered into with hope and expectation and great feeling. And if you study 
the way the covenant is presented in the Old Testament, how it's brought together at Mount Sinai, what you are looking at there is the format that became the wedding ceremony in Jewish society. It's all tied together. So, what do these ten words sound like? What I'm going to do is put them into a, a kind of understanding that allows you to understand them as those who first heard it would have understood it. It's different from the way that we understand it today. Starts off, I am Yahweh, your God. I brought you out of Egypt. So as far as gods go, I am it for you. So no sculpting images to bow down to, to worship or to serve. If I could put that sort of in a funny way in today's vernacular, and some of you will remember this, no plastic Jesus riding on the dashboard of your car. Graven image. He goes on, for like a jilted lover, I am a jealous God, and I will not share you with other gods. And don't go using my name to gain an unfair advantage over others. If you, quote, swear to God, you best be telling the truth, or the consequences will be particularly brutal. I want you to work. That's important. But one day in seven is mine, for resting, Sabbath means to rest, for finding strength to keep working, for worship, praise, and study, to maintain a foundation and a fountain of joy. One day in seven is mine. Now your relationship with me, says God, should also be reflected in your relationship with each other. So, you adult children, honor your parents. Respect them, don't cheat them, take care of them. Don't murder. Taking human life was never a part of God's creation plan, even though sometimes it does and must happen. And I'm thinking primarily of situations of war or when someone threatens. I apologize for putting the next one this way, but it, I think it sums it up well. Don't screw around with someone, not your spouse. Nobody wins. Everybody gets hurt. Where sex is concerned, the grass is not greener on the other side of the fence, and the beast released is not, is not some grass eater, but a flesh-consuming tiger. Don't do it. Stealing hurts others. Just ask someone who's been robbed. And since everything we own belongs to God anyway, stealing is like spitting in God's face. Telling lies about others can ruin their lives. It certainly ruins community. So stop it. Eventually lies boomerang, and they come back to hit the one who told the lies. So again, stop it. Finally, do, do not, not scheme, scheme to acquire what belongs to others. To it's given, given to them to have and to hold for a time, just as God has given us what we have to hold for a time. Control, control this impulse, or in short, it, it will control, control you. you. Living this way would have then and would today have a profound impact on the world. So how did Israel do? How do we do? final night of his earthly life. Jesus provides a meaning for what it is he is about to suffer. He tells us that his body and blood serve as the sacrifice which ratifies the new covenant made between God and us, the new Israel, the one
one that replaces the old Israel, and yes, the broken Sinai covenant that included the Ten Commandments. So in short, they didn't do too well, and we don't do so well either. In this new relationship, the Big Ten, the Ten Commandments, serve as first steps. If you want to see this clearly, go to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew, where he, sta he starts with a commandment. You have heard that it was said to the people of old, do not do this or do this. But I tell you, and then he goes way, way beyond what's said in the commandment. In this new covenant, we are born again. And the resulting culture is not just nationwide, it's a culture that spans the whole world. It puts us in a relationship with brothers and sisters of Christ in every part of the globe. And when we accept the communion cup of wine, as in the old covenant, the cup of salvation, we are accepting a marriage metaphor. We are accepting the fact that God is going to care for us, that God is going to be the one that protects us, that God is going to be the one that leads us and loves us. And all of this has been sealed for us on the cross with Jesus himself as the sacrifice. And so Christianity has the ugliest and most brutal symbol of any religion, a battered, rough cross, a necessary act so offensive that much of the world sees it as either madness or foolishness, as we heard from 1 Corinthians, a stumbling block. But for us, being saved, and I put it being saved in particular because that's the way the word is in 1 Corinthians. It's an ongoing aspect of being saved, an ongoingness of salvation. The cross underlines the depth of Christ's love and therefore God's love for us. The cross is proof of his passionate engagement to us, with us, and for us. So I ask, are you all in? Can I get an amen? amen. Our song of response, number 406, Take My Life That I May Be. Let's stand and sing.
continue with our response with the confession. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father of mercies and God of all consolations, come to the aid of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may attend to your word, confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Let us make confession to God. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. instructed his followers then, quote, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake, forgives us all our sins. Through the Holy Spirit, he cleanses us and gives us power to proclaim the mighty deeds of God, who called us out of darkness into the splendor of his light. In obedience to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Rejoice! The Lord has made you free. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, we rejoice that Deb Lowe has been able to go home this week. We rejoice that Juliana's surgery went well. We pray for both of their recoveries as they move forward from here. I thank you for the strength and the return to health that my mom has experienced. I just pray that you would teach us how to use this, this time, this gift of time that you've given us wisely. We lift up to you Sarah Melstar, uh, who's just been diagnosed with MS at the age of 37. We pray for the Ron family and Pat and the grandmother, the matriarch, who's in stage four bone cancer now under hospice care, that she would not allow her to suffer. We pray for Virginia DeSalvo, who's going to have surgery this week for cancer. Pray for my friend Ralph as he tries to deal with and take care of his friend Fred and of Ralph's wife, Margaret, that she would continue to bless him with health and compassion and wisdom. And we lift up those two who are struggling with mighty health issues. We pray for Mary Cobb, for Bailey, for Jack, for Molly, for C.L. Arnsdorf, for Liz Dean, for Caitlin Dickey and her baby, for um, Jeff and Selma Stevenson, for Ann, for Dave. We pray for Pastor Ellie going through uh, treatment for cancer, for Tim's mom. We pray for Tammy and Ashley. We give thanks that she's still been able to carry this baby and, and pray that she would allow her to carry it full term. We pray for Fran. We pray for um, Stephen Everett as he had to go back into the hospital this week and that she would be able to clear up the issues that are there. Lord, in your mercy. All of us who are in the midst of struggling to say goodbye to someone that we love or trying to just figure out how to get through each day or trying to figure out how we live without a loved one in our lives, and that may be all of us, 
We just ask for your blessings and your peace and your, your conviction that there is going to come a day when all these tears of pain and agony will be wiped away and replaced with tears of joy. So we, we pray for the families of Audrey and Betty and Cody and John and Caleb and others who are not here but whom we hold in our heart. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those struggling with things that are going on for a long time. For Lisa, for Jason, as he looks for a whole new future, very different from the one that he's lived in the past. For mom and dad, for Sharon, for Stephen, as this whole process continues, for Carolyn and Carolyn's son, Rick, for Paul and Brenda and Mary and Daniel and Sarah, as she continues this long journey, for Dorothy, for Virginia, for Arme, and for Isabel, that she would pour a blessing out on them, that they would know your presence. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up to you those who are on the front lines, those who see things that the rest of us never know anything about, whether it's in law enforcement or firefighting or military or hospital or EMTs, that you would use them, but also that you would give them a blessing and wipe away whatever things are in their mind that they don't need to keep seeing. Lord, in your mercy. And we lift up to you those who are reaching out to others in ways that we can't, and we give thanks for the ministries that um, reach others in ways that we can't, and we're grateful that we can support them. For Danny and Rebecca, for John and Carol, for Jimmy, for Lisa, for Kristen, for Christy, for Amber, for Maritime Bethel, and for Matt and Christina Smith. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We receive our offering at this time, and while we're doing that, we will sing verses 1, 5, and 6 of hymn number, I think it's 410, We Give Thee But Thine Own.
that's found in the front of your hymnal on page number 69, the pink column. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Through Abraham and Sarah, you promised to bless all nations. You rescued Israel, your chosen people. Through the prophets, you renewed your promise. And at this end of all the ages, you sent your son, who in words and deeds proclaimed your kingdom and was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. And so in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread of suffering, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. When the supper was concluded, he took the third cup, the cup of salvation, gave thanks, and gave to them, saying, Take and drink. This is my blood. It's shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Therefore, gracious Father, with this bread and cup, we remember the life our Lord offered for us. And believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Amen. Amen. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of our Lord and of his resurrection, that we who receive the Lord's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and receive our inheritance with you, all your saints, in light. Amen. Amen. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and every place, and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. We pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen. The body and blood of the Lord, for the people of the Lord, we invite all who confess Christ as Lord to join with us in this meal of celebration. You may be seated. given for you. The body of Christ 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 given for you. May the Lord fill you with his hope, his joy, and his strength in Jesus' name. The body of Christ given for you. By the love of God, fill your heart this day and every day. The body of Christ given for you. They can eat the body of Christ given for you. May the Lord fill you with his hope, with his joy, with his peace, and with his love. In Christ's name, amen. The body of Christ given for you. They can eat the body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ given for you.
body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. May the Lord come upon you this day and fill you with all of his joy and hope in Christ's name. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. given for you. The body of Christ 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 given for you. May the Spirit of God come upon you with all of His wisdom, with all of His hope and joy in Christ's name. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The Spirit of God come upon you and fill you with all of His wisdom and strength in Jesus' name. The body of Christ given for you. 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 This is the body of Christ which is given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ given for you. Christ given for you. Fill with the love and joy in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Christ given for you. May the Spirit come upon you and fill you with His peace and His hope and His love. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you.
of Christ given for you. The body 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 of Christ given for you. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you to life everlasting. Amen. Our post communion canticle is hymn number 339. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Our closing song, Rock of Ages.
ask me or any of the committee members, and I'll be glad to talk to you about anything you need to know. So. I'm reading from Matthew. One evening after Jesus had fed a large crowd with just five loaves of bread and two fish, he sent his disciples ahead of him in a boat while he went up on the mountain to pray. During the night, the disciples' boat was battered by waves, and they were struggling against the wind. In the early hours of the morning, Jesus came to them, walking on the water. Seeing him, the disciples were frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Jesus reassured them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Peter, one of the disciples, responded by saying, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus invited Peter to come, and Peter stepped out of the boat and began walking on the water toward Jesus. However, when Peter noticed the strong wind, he became afraid and began to sin. He cried out to Jesus for help, and Jesus immediately reached out, called him, and said, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? The moral significance of this story for Christians today is often seen as a lesson about faith and trust in Jesus, especially during challenging times, which is where we are. So um, with that, let us pray. As we search for our new pastor, and it takes longer than we want it to, help us, Lord, to understand that it is your will that is done, not ours. It is God's timing, not ours. Lord, help us to not lose sight of you. Help us to keep the faith. As we prepare our hearts for you, Lord, we pray that you keep us strong and diligent in your works. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. That passage has been used for almost 2,000 years to refer to the church as the ship on the ocean. And if you go into many old church buildings, you notice that the ceiling with all of its wood and stuff is shaped as the upside down version of a boat. That's why it's called the nave, as in navy. So we are the ship on the sea. Here's the sending charge. Believe, beloved in the Lord, God has shown you what is good. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Go and do.